Hello everyone, Dan Swift here, founder and CEO at Numentum. And welcome to the speaker series, where we spotlight some of the most interesting minds in the world of revenue generation. At Numentum, we help forward-thinking B2B organizations create better buyer experiences and deliver new momentum to their revenue engine. On this episode of the speaker series, we speak with Jason Rose, Chief Marketing Officer at Pure Storage. We have a great conversation around leadership, the power of data, and the importance of asking questions. Jason, welcome to the speaker series. Dan, thrilled to be here and really great to be on the line with you. I know it's been a little while and uh, just thrilled uh, to, to have the conversation today. Absolutely. So um, well, let's jump straight in. Um, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing right now. Now, I know you joined um, as Chief Marketing Officer at Pure about 18 months ago. Is that right? Yep, that's uh, September 2020. So yeah, almost uh, right on there. Wow. So so why don't we kick it off? Why don't you share a little bit about Pure Storage for context with our listeners? And then what is it specifically that Pure is solving for your customers? Sure. Great question, Dan. And uh, interestingly, uh, so so we actually make things, which which uh, for those of you that uh, kind of uh, focus in B2B software or uh, things of that nature, uh, the concept of supply chain, spare parts, all of that, um, were new to me. I, I, I'm a kind of cloud software uh, person uh, going way back. So this is the first time I've been at a company that actually builds and delivers basically big storage arrays. So for, you know, you hear data is the new oil. Well, we built the drums the oil goes into. To, uh, so to speak, uh, to, in its most simplest terms. But really, uh, what Pure Storage is a relative newcomer to a, a very well-established uh, market space, right? So uh, about 10 years ago, our founder uh, saw an opportunity where Flash was just coming into uh, the market uh, as a medium versus kind of spinning disk uh, hard drives. And we founded the company on building from the ground up around Flash. So a lot of companies, believe it or not, what they took is they took this new flash medium and they stuck it in the same case as a hard drive and called it a solid state drive. Well, that's just replicating the old on a slightly faster medium. So yeah, there's performance boosts and everything else, but we built from the ground up for flash, which actually makes us 80% more efficient than our competitors' flash drives, <laughs> right? Like forget spinning disk. It doesn't even like register. Yeah on the uh, market and for companies like Meta, um, with formerly Facebook, right? Uh, they just announced they're building an AI artificial intelligence super cluster with over an exabyte of storage, all delivered by Pure. So what we're doing is we're actually delivering high performance storage to these like great workloads, right? Uh, you know, to drive some of the most innovative companies on the planet. Um, I don't know if, uh, if folks on the line uh, follow uh, uh, Formula One racing, but the uh, Mercedes team, which is one of the most winning Formula One uh, teams of all mm -hmm. time, actually runs all of their simulations on pure storage, right? So when they go into the wind tunnel, when they crunch all the numbers from the race, they actually bring one of our arrays with them to each race uh, and have it in the garage for crunching all the numbers and providing the telemetric data out to the drivers, which is pretty awesome. And those wow. are just two examples of, of some of the really exciting use cases. Cause I got to tell you when I moved out of customer experience marketing, which, you know, is kind of the cutting edge of, uh, you know, kind of engagement and everything else. And I think where you and I met, then yep, yep. the data storage people went what are you nuts you're going into data storage like isn't that just a commodity like so you know pure is the disruptor in this market uh in our latest uh, financial year we're a publicly traded company we're about 2.5 billion um in annual sales and we grew at 41 percent year on year in this past fiscal year whereas our biggest competitor shrank three percent in the same category mm -hmm. To give you an idea, so it's a really exciting place to be, um, really disrupting. You know what uh, may be considered a commodity market by some, but really, as things move more towards real time and the world is always accelerating, right? Um, I think this is a really exciting segment of the market to be in, and we're in a very disruptive position. So a lot of the, the the reason people like the speaker series is they get to hear from people like yourself the CMO at a company that has grown 40%. And they're thinking, particularly for people early on in their career, how do we, how do I get to, 
do what Jason does at some point in my role and, and have that sort of thing. So, so let's go back to the start of your career. Now, you started with um, uh, Arthur Anderson, right? That's right. I had nothing to do with Enron. Uh, for those of you <laughs> old enough to remember uh, yeah. Arthur Anderson, right? It was one of the big five uh, kind of um, uh, uh, financial audit and consulting firms uh, on the planet. I think it was like number one or number two. Um, Enron happened, which was a big uh, kind of uh, scandal and actually brought down the whole company, um, right? But I left actually just prior to that, but started my career as a line consultant, um, you know, helping out actually in the financial services sector up in Canada. I'm Canadian um, originally, but uh, as a line consultant uh, working on uh, Bay Street up there in Toronto, uh, big shout out to all the Canadians listening in and, uh, you know, kind of uh, progress from there. And, and But you, you say progress from there, like, so massive shift from, yes. from that role to now being the CMO at Pure. So, and, and obviously we know each other from, from SAP and the, the CX days, um, but you went to CX, sorry, you went to SAP, I should say, through acquisition twice. Is that yes. right? That's right. So, so let, 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 let's just unpack all of that a little <laughs> yeah, bit. Yeah. I, I think it is interesting, you know, people go to school for a certain subject and they kind of mm. figure that's locking them in on a career path. Well, uh, to be clear, I am a CPA. Um, so I'm a certified mm. professional accountant by trade. I still actually have my designation, but here I am, uh, you know, with a, you know, almost 20 year career now in marketing. Right. So, right. Um, you know, really uh, kind of came to it naturally. Um, you know, I went from uh, doing financial services consulting for Arthur Anderson to, we didn't call them startups back then, but it was a 30 person software company in Toronto that was doing planning, budgeting and forecasting for banks, right? So a very natural mm -hmm. progression. I was a consultant, worked on the merger integration of JP Morgan and Chase Manhattan. Um, you know, back in the day when JP Morgan was an investment bank, Chase was a big uh, retail bank and they brought the two of them together. So I worked through that. It was a lot of work. I was working down on Wall Street. I was probably pulling 80 to 90 hours a week. You know, I'm falling asleep on the floor of the office, like literally. But when you're, you know, mid 20s, it's kind of mm -hmm. like you know, what you uh, aspire to do. I had a managing director office on the 42nd floor of 60 Wall Street, looking out over the Statue of Liberty and the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm like, okay, not I'm too bad. There you this, go. Is, this, is, this is pretty all right. Uh, but then you like kind of get into that grind and I'm like, okay, um, I'm at this company and we brought in a couple of guys uh, from Oracle um, and one was heading up something called pre-sales and the other one was heading up sales. And I'm like, what's this pre-sales thing? And they're like, basically you're the rock star of the software industry, right? You basically, mm -hmm. you, you, you walk in, you demonstrate the software, you get everybody like high-fiving and doing the wave when you're doing your job, right? Right. You feel the whole room turn. Mm -hmm. So I, I moved into that side. So I moved out of consulting into pre-sales. And then lo and behold, uh, I left that company, went to another company that got bought by a company called Business Objects. Okay. So uh, when I we got bought by Business Objects, I'm like, okay, pre-sales was really fun. It was really cool. But I was at, I met my uh, what fiance, now wife, uh, back at the time, we're ready to settle down. And if you, for those pre-sales people out there, you know, you're on the road every week, you're traveling mm -hmm. somewhere. It's a pretty intense uh, lifestyle. So uh, they had something called product marketing. I'm like, what is this product marketing thing? I've never heard of it before, but I literally picked up from Midtown Manhattan where I was living at the time and moved to San Jose, California to do product marketing now so for the same thing, financial planning and analysis. So fit really well with my accounting background. And then, uh, you know, uh, did that for three years. So learned the, the trade inside business objects, which had a really fabulous framework for product marketing. Um, and then lo and behold, we get bought by SAP. So that was my first time into SAP, um, got to work with some fabulous people, um, you know, um, Sanjay Poonin, who uh, was at uh, VMware for, for a really long time, Stephanie Buscemi, uh, the former CMO of uh, Salesforce, were like my direct stakeholders and managers, uh, respectively, wow. a guy named Steve Lucas, who, uh, you know, has been uh, around the industry a fair bit. Uh, and you just being a sponge, I learned so much. I went from being a director to a VP in charge of uh, the entire BI and advanced analytics portfolio. And then around 2014, after six years at SAP, you're kind of like, all right, I'm in the middle of Silicon Valley. Um, maybe I want to go out and do a startup, right? So then I went and did, at the time, social data was a really big thing. And Dan, mm -hmm. I know this is right yep. in your backyard. Uh, you know, so we were, we had the full Twitter fire hose. Uh, we were uh, feeding into different social listening platforms, all that. Um, well, Four weeks after I joined that company, Twitter pulled the fire hose, uh, which was oh, like 93%. I remember, yeah, yeah. Like, oh boy, what have I done? But you, you know, again, like people think marketing, like 
in some cases, it's like the pretty pictures, happy ears, you're always spinning things into a positive light. But I'm like, where marketing truly earns its stripes is in that point of crisis. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we message, communicate, show empathy towards our customers and our partners and our stakeholders, you know, and really be that advocate for that outside in um, perspective into a company and how you communicate. So believe me, I earned my stripes big time getting ready for, you know, was Twitter going to aggressively come after us because they'd acquired a company in our sector? Da, 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 da. Um, so, I, you know, learned a lot. It was a very intense 18 month period. And then I moved to a company called Gigia, which did customer identity and access management, which is like a compliance and uh, social login kind of uh, play. Uh, GDPR was just coming on strong in Europe, which is, a, I'm sure, an acronym everybody on this call is somewhat familiar with at this point. Um, and, you know, that gave us a huge amount of velocity uh, in the market. And lo and behold, who comes along but SAP uh, to <laughs> acquire uh, Gigia. And I found myself back at SAP um, for my second tenure, which was a lot of fun. I got to work with uh, the then CMO, uh, Alicia Tillman, and I took over, um, you know, digital marketing. So I owned SAP.com, all the social channels, you know, LinkedIn, um, Google, uh, Twitter, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and I owned all of the campaigns. So basically how we went to market for each one of our different business line. So really exciting. Learned how to, I went from managing teams of, you know, 10 to 20 people um, to managing 200 plus people um, inside SAP, which again is a different scale, right? Yeah. Like, so it just requires different, uh, you know, muscles, different ways of communicating. Now you're uh, managing leaders of leaders, right? So um, mm -hmm. how do you manage those folks? And then lo and behold, um, you know, uh, I left um, SAP in 2020. And then a few months later, I popped back up at um, Pure storage um, and, you know, uh, really had the great opportunity to come in and really um, organize structure and hire a pretty fabulous team. So it's been 18 months of, um, you know, really um, understanding the organization, understanding the market, and then creating the team that then uh, could best serve the organization and our mission uh, in the market. So that's really what's been keeping me busy over the last 18 months, not to mention yeah. you know, supporting pipeline and hyper growth and re-messaging and product launches and all the other stuff that goes along with being a CMO. I'm going to take you back just 18 months. How is onboarding to Pure during a global pandemic as the CMO? How did that play out? Well, it was it was challenging, but you know, interestingly, um, you know, uh, Pure Storage went full shutdown. So, like mm -hmm. all of uh, everybody went remote. None of the offices were open. You weren't even allowed to go in. But coincidentally, um, I started the day after Labor Day. Well, the day after that, um, Charlie uh, Giancarlo, our CEO, had his senior leadership offsite, which was the first mm -hmm. in-person thing they'd done since yeah. March of that year. So literally, it was all social distance. We did it outdoor on a tennis court. And I don't know, Dan, I, I'm not sure where you're located, but there was this couple of day period where the sky literally turned orange. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, in uh, California, and it was yeah. like the apocalypse. Well, that was right when that offsite was. So oh, first time together with the new management team, um, you know, social distance, sitting outside. It was supposed to be like 95 uh, that day was what the uh, forecast was called. It never got above 70, right? Like, because <laughs> of that weird yeah. cloud thing, everything was orange. We're like, I'm like, kind of like, is this a sign? Like, I, I mean, the whole world <laughs> turned orange. Our, 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 our corporate brand color is orange. Yeah. I'm like, okay, maybe there's something. It was there. meant to be. Exactly. So, so it was good in that. So I had that quick, you know, kind of in person and then everything remote again for yeah. uh, pretty much, um, pretty much my entire tenure, um, other yeah. than a couple of uh, off sites here and there. But, you know, it, it, it's both a leveling, like it, it kind of equalizes, but it forces mm -hmm. you to be super deliberate with your meetings and your calendar, right? Because yeah. there's just so many, there's only so many meetings you can fit in and you lose that unstructured, like, hey, let's just go grab lunch. Let's go grab a coffee, right? So, um, you know, I, I did things like I did open office hours. So I'd yeah. block 90 minutes on my calendar and I do 15 minute sessions with anybody who wanted to inbound and just meet the new CMO and have a conversation, right? To kind of try to 
replicate some of those ad hoc things that you lose uh, when you go uh, virtual. Um, monthly all hands calls. So I, I, I'm a big believer in communication. Um, weekly uh, marketing leadership team meetings. And then I'm very adamant about having a weekly one on one with each one of my direct reports. So, nice. um, you know, I think that creates a cadence that creates a team atmosphere. Uh, you get comfortable with people so we can still have fun, joke around, but we also know, you know, what the big overwhelming uh, objectives are for the company, for the marketing team, the transformation, um, really making sure we're aligned to stakeholders in the market. So um, it's been it's been a fun journey, but I think, you know, a lot of it is just being systematic in your approach mm. and making sure that, you know, you've got your um, kind of uh, must haves in terms of uh, that uh, cadence of, of what you're doing. Mm. And then, you know, just being, understanding, bringing people in. Now we do a voluntary in office once a week because um, mm -hmm. Santa Clara County lifted their mask mandate. So our offices are now semi-open. So once, um, I think it's every two weeks or once a month at least, we're doing an, a voluntary in office day for the marketing team. So I live up in Tahoe, uh, hence the mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of background, but, uh, you know, really um, could try to go down to Mountain View uh, and meet as many people in person as possible through that uh, methodology. Wonderful, wonderful. So, so a lot of the people that we've had on this speaker series um, say, obviously, the last two to three years, they've learned a lot about themselves. What, what do you feel so you've learned about yourself, both, both, yes, professionally, but also personally over the last two to three years? Well, well, it's interesting. And, and I think many executives probably find themselves in the same boat. Like I was um, you know, a United Airlines traveler, right? And there's something called, uh, you know, there's 1K, which is their kind of published top tier. And then there's something called global services, which is kind of even above that. So I was a global services traveler, which wow. meant, you know, you're on the road traveling, mm -hmm. if not every other week, sometimes every week, but you're constantly traveling all around the world. Global remit, probably four or five trips to Europe every year, two or three trips to Asia, um, and then all across the U.S. supporting um, different events and people. And, you know, I was consistently that for, for many years. And my kids, my oldest is about to turn 15 uh, next week. Mm -hmm. I've got a 15-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 10-year-old, okay? So my kids are relatively young. And what I didn't realize is, like, like, you know, when I, when I stopped traveling, <laughs> like all, all the family, like I was able to drop my kids off at school. Dan, yeah. Right. Like, unfortunately I live in Nevada, so the school stayed open. So I could actually drive them um, mm. to school. I could be much more a part of the routine. So for me, it was like this, like kind of awakening. Aha. I was like, I didn't realize how much I was traveling and how that prevented me from playing a bigger role in my kid's life. Um, mm -hmm. And now I have equally as intensive job, even even more. But because everything's moved to Zoom, I'm able to structure it. I don't have to worry like where am I next week and what time do I have to go catch my flight and do I have to fly out? Usually, you know, when you go to Europe, you'd fly out Sunday afternoon, right? So you mm -hmm. could be there Monday to hit the ground running. Um, and now, you know, I've I've kind of gotten that time back. And I got to tell you, like, there's as a CMO, I'm super excited for people to go back to in person. So we just did a big healthcare event a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, both our employees uh, staffing the booth, but also the people attending the conference were over the moon, right? Um, mm. I, I just found out we closed, uh, you know, a, a, a really decent sized deal from the event um, oh, right, nice. like, right after. And I'm like, yeah, uh, people are excited to be back. Business is being transacted. But at the same time, I'm also thinking like, Dan, how do I strike the right balance? I don't want to mm -hmm. go back to 2019 and um, I don't want to be global services. <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah. Like I just don't want to be in that category. So now it's going to be how do I balance, um, you know, kind of the the virtual remote, um, you know, kind of uh, being in office in Mountain View, which is, you know, again, causes me to be away a couple of nights and managing a global team where I think things are going to go back uh, to in person, but but striking, I think, a better balance because now I've seen mm -hmm. both sides. I've, I've done the intensive travel, which I think all of us were kind of expected to do um, yeah. as part of our role. But now as the world reopens, I'm hoping to set better boundaries for myself and my family so that I can accomplish both. I can still do the, the uh, executive role that I need to do, but also balance it better, um, you know, with my family and, and being able to participate in some of those more routine items, right? It's not just the birthdays or whatever. It's like, you know, kind of that daily routine and rhythm of life that I've been able to experience over the last 18, well, two years since the uh, pandemic began, right? Yeah, it resonates so much with me. As you know, I've got a, a six-year-old, a four-year-old and a 
at the moment, it's the moment I'm a 12 week old. So uh, <laughs> wow. talk, talk, yeah, talk about being hands on and involved. Um, again, I was the same as yourself traveling so much. And that's just gonna, it's gonna resonate with people listening to this. It's, uh, it's that work life integration. I'm not going to say yeah. balance. No, no, there's no balance. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. Let's talk leadership. Now you mentioned your team around the world. Um, so many people speak so highly of you, Jason. So I want to talk leadership with you. How would you how would you describe your leadership style, and and why do you think people enjoy working so much under your leadership? Well, I, I think it, it it's really two things. It's having that people orientation and making sure you make the time for. Um, you know, kind of that regular like routine, just like I said with the yeah. kids, like being there for those day to day things. It's not just, oh, my gosh, I've got this huge project. Jason, can I get some of your mind share? It's like, no, no, no. every week we're going to connect. Mm. We're going to prioritize. And then, um, you know, I'm also um, someone who knows enough about everything to be dangerous. Right. Mm. Like there's no one part. Like if you ask me, like, Jason, is there a part of marketing that you you know want to learn more about or don't understand? I'm like, no, I've I've managed the full gamut of marketing for, I don't know, since 2014. So it's eight years since I've taken that first kind of full scope role. So I've taken, and the nice thing is doing it in startup land, you kind of have to learn um, mm -hmm. each segment of, of the marketing business, which is a diverse business, right? You've got everything from uh, communications and analyst relations and press all the way to performance marketing, digital, and, you know, always on programs and, and everything in between product marketing, mm -hmm. enablement, um, SDR functions. Like, I mean, you know, there's a lot going on. But what it enables me to do is one, um, kind of understand the function and make sure I'm hiring, you know, in my team about 180 plus people in the organization. So for me, it was really important to find specialists in each one of my functional areas. So I reorganized the entire team. When I joined, I had four direct reports. I'm like four direct reports, like, you know, and digital and brand was combined and field had all of the, um, you know, global events and um, digital marketing and everything else was in the field. And so it was a very collapsed management structure. And I'm like, I couldn't have a deep enough conversation to really understand what was going on because mm. even the people behind uh, below me had such a broad scope they couldn't have their arms around everything. I'm like, that's now not how I operate. I'm I'm curious. I'm challenging. I want to know what's going on. So you know, setting up functional areas where it's very clear roles and responsibilities, clear accountability, right, uh, Dan? So that people can you know really have a clear understanding of what their scope is and what success looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And then knowing enough about the function, I can challenge those leaders without micromanaging. Right. So yeah. I ask lots of questions. I'm uh, curious. I want to know what's going on, but I'm also not telling them you have to go do this or that. Um, and then wrapping them on the knuckles if it doesn't get done. Right. I'm kind of like, you're empowered, but I'm going to ask lots of questions and I'm hoping that you're going to give me really good answers. Right. <laughs> right. So, so it's that kind of relationship that I try to build. And then, you know, that weekly team meeting, like I, I I'm religious. I only do 30 minute meetings, um, mm. you know, in general. Um, but my, my weekly team meeting is 90 minutes. So I'm like, this is the one time a week where we come together as a management team and we really discuss the business. We go through all the metrics. We talk about different projects, the big priorities going on, and we have a discussion, right? And mm -hmm. it's, it's the full team and everybody gets to input, right? So we are, you know, listening, uh, we're talking, we're, um, you know, really hashing out the, the big challenges we're facing as an organization. And I think that creates, you know, everybody's fingerprints are kind of on the mm -hmm. planet we're going and what we're doing and are aware of each other's challenges. And then, you know, when, when you've got those more specific topics, that's where I have my 30 minute one-on-ones and we, we go deep on the business and uh, everything else. And I think kind of setting up that cadence, that kind of safe environment where people can voice opinions and feel like they're helping run the full ship of marketing, as opposed to just mm -hmm. their little piece, I think really creates teamwork camaraderie and uh, you know, a really great working environment. This is a super tactical question, but is that team meeting at the start of the week or the end of the week? Or Tuesday, Tuesday mornings. Tuesday, Tuesday mornings at uh, you know uh, eight thirty in the morning, and mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to have it early in the week. But I don't like Mondays and Fridays because holidays mm -hmm. pop up, and then you miss yeah. you know a week. And I find if I go two weeks without having my full leadership team on a call, I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on anymore. So um, I try I try to do it on Tuesdays because in general, um, there's not a holiday that's going to kind of knock us off our cadence. Yeah, helpful. Thank you. So um, eight years, you've mismentioned it, um, having full responsibility. So let's talk about the role of the CMO. How has it changed? Um, what, what's your perspective on that? 
Well, it's interesting. Like, you know, I, I've always looked at, um, you know, marketing as in service of the organization mm-hmm. in which you work, right? So if you think you're going to come in as the CMO and dictate a strategy. I'm like, no, no, no. We're we're here to help support the company's mission and vision in the market. Uh, Pure Storage, for example, is 100% partner uh, fulfilled. So every mm-hmm. deal we do, every single one has a partner. Um, so again, as 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 I kind of look at it, you know, people will also ask me, Dan, like, well, you know, Jason, how do you measure marketing success? Right. right. So as a CMO and a leader, like, how do you know if you're successful? And, and I give, I think, what some people might consider a surprising answer. I'm like, if my CEO and my head of sales are happy, we're doing our job. Yep. Yep. And people go like, what? Like they were expecting, oh, if I've got an ROI, a marketing investment of XYZ or brand awareness of greater than blah, blah, blah with my target market. Like I'm like, yep, all of those things are important. But at the end of the day, if I'm aligned with my head of sales in terms of product priority, what the sales strategy is and how we're supporting it. And from a strategy perspective for the CEO, are we talking about the right strategy, the right target markets as the company evolves? Because your big product today, you want to always keep that growing, but there's probably two or three other products coming behind that are going to accelerate. Mm-hmm. And if those are in different target markets, you need to be able to accommodate that, right? So I look at it and I go, yes, there's a whole dashboard, you know, by region, by theater. We, we focus on something called in-quarter create um, pipeline, right? So for mm. me, as a marketeer, like it's great to look at the all-up pipeline, right? But really what matters? I'm like, what matters is what I'm creating in quarter. And then I trust that uh, we kind of uh, kind of measure uh, the opportunity and that's when the pipeline gets counted. Okay, check, we've got pipeline, there's a real deal, there's revenue associated with it. And then I trust uh, you know my sales counterpart to take that opportunity and run it through to close. Now, having said that with product marketing and portfolio marketing, we're there supporting deal acceleration and field enablement and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, I know, every quarter, I need just like a salesperson, right? Every quarter, yeah, hey, guess what? The, the numbers roll over, you're back to zero and you got to hit your quarterly target, right? Well, for marketing, I want to drive that kind of alignment in my team. Every quarter, we look at how much in quarter create pipeline can we create to make sure we're supporting the run rate the business um, needs. So it's doing things like that that drive alignment um, to the sales leader and organization, but then also with portfolio and strategy and messaging, making sure I'm aligned to the CEO and what our overall mission is, uh, you know, good communication with the board. Uh, you know, those are the things that I really look to as, as driving success of the marketing organization and being a good business partner, um, not only to sales, but also to our business units, to the CEO and to our uh, leadership team. So, so what are the, th- I mean, you mentioned a few of them right there. Um, obviously collaboration with executive leadership, with um, mm-hmm. uh, your peers, with sales. Are there any other strategies or approaches that you think other marketing leaders could and should be doubling down on right now? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I'll, I'll speak both organizationally and then more broadly yeah. into the market, right? Like my first probably four to five months, we're really trying to understand who the stakeholders are uh, mm-hmm. in the organization and what their kind of overall uh, net promoter score, as it were, uh, uh, for marketing was. So I heard product launches at Pure Storage were terrible for years and years. Um, so that was uh, a great deal of feedback from both the business unit leaders as well as um, Charlie, our CEO. So I'm like, okay, we got to work on product launches. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just alignment to the BU, because also product launch was almost like we issued a PR, we did a web webinar and then nothing, right? Like Mm. nothing happened afterwards. And I'm like, okay, so we also need to integrate in and let them know from a field cadence perspective, what are the events? What are the webinars? What are the campaigns that we're running? How does that tie into digital? And and actually set up points of contact for those stakeholders that they never had a single point of contact and visibility across the marketing team. They only had visibility into the little pieces that those those moments that pop up above uh, the waterline, so to speak, for a launch. And that was like Mm. literally the only view they had into marketing. I'm like, well, we've got a lot going on. Let's align, uh, you know, people in marketing to give our BU leaders like a, a more full picture of everything uh, we're doing as an example of, uh, of what we set up. Now, having said that, so that that's kind of the internal point of view and making sure that um, I've got resources and alignment to our key stakeholders as an organization. And I've got to tell you, if you went out and polled my business unit leaders right now and asked, how's marketing doing? I think we get pretty good grades. And not only that, they'd have good visibility into what we're doing to support uh, you know, that part of the overall business, right? 
But then from, okay, Jason, that's great. And you're talking a lot of inside baseball right now, right? Like uh, internally, what are you doing externally, right? So again, it's, it's doing things like getting aligned on our ideal customer profile. Right. So we spent a lot of work. We've identified over 280,000 accounts. And this is Dan now getting into your, uh, you know, kind of bellywick, uh, so, so to speak. And then it, it's it decomposing those into, you know, um, you know, what's surging right now or hot from an intent perspective, who's hitting and, and, and kind of coming to our website and maybe filling out some high intent forms or attending a webinar or uh, downloading a bunch of content. And then how do we surface that? Because, again, you know, one of the big areas of focus now that I've got kind of that aligned organizational structure, I've got my stakeholder alignment. Now I'm really focused on, you know, how do we take more of an account approach versus a marketing qualified lead approach, mm. right? Because one of the big metrics for marketing for a lot of years was how many leads are you passing to the SDRs? Right, <laughs> and how right, are those right. leads converting? And how are they moving to opportunity, which is actually, you know, a pretty myopic view of the world, right? Because at the end of the day, we all know everything's moved to a buying center, or it, actually saying it's moved to that is a little disingenuous. We right. looked at it wrong. We, we looked at it as, oh, you're an MQL, you're the one that's interested, obviously, you're going to be the decision maker. And that's not how the world worked, right? Though it's always been a buying center. Um, so now how, how do we as a marketing team actually, rather than passing individual leads uh, over the fence, how do we really uh, present an account? And, you know, in some cases that account may not even filled out anything to do with marketing. It's just, we're seeing intent data that says, Hey, these people are probably out in market searching. And if we're not involved in the competition, uh, in the conversation or competition is right. So, um, you know, we're working through that right now with our, um, kind of SDR, uh, team, but also not only that, like we, we've still got the legacy inbound and outbound Dan, which mm -hmm. I th I'm like, okay, this is nuts. Like if I've got somebody from a company that's, uh, you know, filled out a high intent form and attended a webinar and I pass them to an SDR and on the outbound side, they're calling into that account. Like, okay, wait a minute, shouldn't we be bringing these things together and using that as another intense signal to really make sure we're uh, got the right coverage on the accounts that are uh, displaying that intent either through third-party data, but I would say even more importantly, through the first party uh, right. information that we're collecting from our own property. So Dan, that's a journey we're on right now. And I'm really excited about just the opportunity to supercharge that because my MQL conversion rate was sub 2%. I'm like, right. like just fold up the marketing department and send them all. <laughs> that's uh, that's absolutely terrible. And some of that, you know, again, for example, if somebody attended a webinar, we pass them to the SDR. Right. I'm like, just because they attended a webinar, like, oh yeah, well, we've got, you know, they've got a pulse and, you know, we have information <laughs> on them. Why wouldn't we call them? <laughs> yeah. But I, but I think that there's so many, so many companies are still doing that, Jason. You yeah. know, it's, it's yeah. I don't think they've evolved beyond that. And what a, what a waste of time for the SDR and also like harassing the poor person who showed up at the webinar um, with, you know, put in our. Well, and Dan, it gets better. And, and, and this is something I'm really working on with my sales team. So they might get a little offended that I'm, I'm mentioning it, but they also outsourced our uh, inbound team and they mm -hmm. have a 90 days up and out policy. So every 90 days, I have a new class of SDRs that are managing the marketing leads. And I'm like going, mm -hmm. okay, these are the most high value, high intent leads that are coming into the company. And you're giving them to the lowest cost, most junior person in the entire company and going, not only that, like take this lead where somebody showed some interest in pure storage and please turn it into a multi-million dollar deal opportunity for me before you hand it over. Could you do that for me? Uh, Mr. or Miss person who just came out of college and yeah. um, figuring out how to use their email, right? I'm like going, okay, this just doesn't feel quite right to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> some things right off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. So um, I've got to ask you, we, we talk, <laughs> we could go deep on a whole oh, separate sure. session on just that yeah. one. But um, so let, let's talk a little bit about, um, I, I mentioned integration, I think it's a little bit of balance too, but how do you stay balanced with such a big job with so much responsibility? How, how do you do that? I, I think really what I, I call it picking your altitude, right? Mm. So, um, you know, it, like at, at a certain point, even as a, a, a beginning manager, you realize if your mission is to make sure everybody's doing their job and whether or not you're going to do it for them, that doesn't scale, right? There's only so much time in a day to do all that. So at some point you have to realize, okay, like at what level of detail do I get into and how involved do I get in what my team is doing, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, it's, it's picking that altitude, like making sure that I'm setting the strategy, goals, objectives, that we're cascading those appropriately. I mentioned I do a monthly all hands call. So mm -hmm. that's actually a really important part of my month is like, what are the topics? What are the things that I want to communicate to the 
the broader organization? And more as importantly, what guests am I going to have on to talk about the roadmap or strategy, um, sales execution, things like that, so that I can show we're uh, an integrated part of the organization. We're um, providing people updates on our goals and objectives on a monthly basis. And what are the priorities, right? So I, I think, Dan, you and I work together enough, you know, I'm a three things guy, like, mm -hmm. you know, people who, here's your priorities and it's 15 things. I'm like, okay, you are, you have no idea what a priority is if you're going to say there's 15 priorities, but Jason, it's a big business and there's so much going on. And, you know, all these 50, I'm like, yeah, but there's probably only three that are actually important. Like if you drop the other 12 and focused on three things you could actually get done, what would they be? Right? Like, so I'm like very big on that. And that I think helps rally, like I said, the, uh, you know, almost 200 folks in this organization, understanding what the priorities are, what's being celebrated, um, what are the stakeholders we're bringing in, what their sentiment is, so they can feel like they're a part of this bigger organization, even in COVID, right, where mm -hmm. we're not getting together and we're not in the office and having those ad hoc meetings in the hallway. So, um, you know, it's like I said, it's picking that altitude and then you know, trusting the fact that you've, in my case, I got to hire pretty much my entire leadership team, right? Trusting that those folks have the next level. Their folks have the lit level below that. Because if I start stressing out about, you know, what product mar marketer Y for pro product X is doing down in this area, um, is their message house perfect? And what's the sales enablement strategy? You, you just wouldn't be able to sleep at night, right? Right, right. What, what about outside of work? So you mentioned family earlier on. I believe you're a skier. Like, how, how is that? Is that how you kind of get out and just just shake it all off and just get some fresh air? Is that how you kind of relax a little bit? Uh, absolutely. I, I've got 24 days of skiing in um, this right. season, which I'm, I, nice. I, I, my goal is 34. I did 34 <laughs> last year. I can't, I can't backslide on that. So <laughs> I've got about a month left, uh, left in the season. So hopefully I'll get 10 more days in nice. uh, before the end of it. But, but really it is, um, you know, it's also unplugging. Like I, I will tell you mm. like, okay, we're all always on. Like we've got mm. uh, a phone in our pocket that's constantly bleeping and uh, buzzing. But I'll give you example, an example. Like um, I got some feedback from our CEO via someone else over the weekend. And I'm like, you know what? That can wait till Monday. Morning. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm just not going to go and work on that right now. I'll get up early Monday. I'll take care of it. Cause I'm not going to let it bleed into my personal time on the weekend. And I try to do the same thing on the evening, uh, on my evenings. Right. Like, and it's interesting. Your family will always keep you honest. I'm like, no, I'm really good. I don't look at my phone in the evening. They're like, dad, you're always on your phone. Like, what are you talking about? So, <laughs> yeah. so it, it like kind of keeps you honest. Like even when you think you're doing a good job, check in with the ones closest to you and, and validate it's the same thing in business, you know, check in yeah. with your stakeholders. You might think you're doing a great job, but really, you know, hopefully you have that trusting relationship with your stakeholders and with your family where they can feed you back. And I really do try. I know I'm a better marketer and executive uh, when I do take that time for myself versus just always working, always trying to do the next thing, right? Love it, love it. Um, almost the final question for you, but this is all very positive. There's got to be some things that frustrate you, right? There's got to be. So what's a non-starter for you? Is, is, is there one thing that just frustrates you about business, life, people? Like, if What is that one thing? Well, it, 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 it's one of those things where you can tell, like, I'm a, a big believer in being of service and partnership, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what, what drives, like, in business, what drives me nuts is um, there was somebody who had a call with one of the VPs that reports to me and basically told her, you need to do this, this, and this. And I'm like, who the heck is this person from that organization? And why are they telling, you know, my vice president how they should be running their business? It's her right. business. In partnership, you shouldn't be coming in and dictating and stuff like that gets the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. Cause a lot of times I got to tell you, marketing was not in very high esteem when I joined, right? We mm. just didn't have the right stakeholder alignment. Like I said, product launches were a very contentious uh, topic, weren't done very well. So there's a lot of questioning, like how good a partner is marketing. And I think we've, we've overcome that. So when I run into those situations where, well, I'm just going to knock those marketeers into place and tell them what to do. That drives me nuts. I'm like, no, right. no, no partnership, you know, we're all in this together, one team, one dream, let's work together. So that, that kind of drives, drives me a little nuts. If I can pick one thing that uh, <laughs> kind of gets me <laughs> going, right. Now I said the penultimate question, we've actually got a quick fire round before we let you go. A little bit of fun. Uh, are you good for this, Jason? Can right, we let's give it do a it. Dan, looking forward <laughs> to it. Sure. All right. If there's anything that you say that I want to push a little bit deeper on, I will, but um, let's go. So question number one, Who's your hero? 
I'd say my dad. I mean, you know, kind of growing up, he was kind of always there. I, I'm the son of a minister, so he was up preaching every day in front of oh, a, wow. uh, you know, um, uh, in, in front of the church. And I got to say, like, I love presenting. I love kind of being in front of people. And that really kind of came from him and his genuine kind of passion and ability to both captivate and educate, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the I'll call it an audience, right? The uh, mm-hmm. parishioners at the, uh, at the church we attended. Beautiful. I love it. Um, the best sales leader, and I'm putting you on the spot, that you've ever partnered with. Well, Dan Fitzsimmons right here at uh, Pierce. Yeah, there, you <laughs> there you go. Well done. Well played, sir. Um, are you a morning lark or a night owl? Uh, morning lark. Uh, if I don't get my solid eight hours of sl- sleep, you do not want to deal with me uh, the <laughs> next day. Uh, what was your last Halloween costume? Uh, I was a steampunk, so I had the whole top hat and the glasses ah. and everything like that. It was fun, yeah. Do pictures exist? I, I think they may, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, what's your favorite city in the world? You said you did a lot of travel. What's your favorite one? I love Barcelona. Um, I just think between the food and the culture and the nightlife and everything else, I think it's just, and the climate, right? All of it kind of just works in that city's favorite. I can't wait to get back there. I, I haven't been there for uh, two and a half years, so looking forward to getting back. Nice. Is there a city or a country that you've not been to that you'd really like to visit? Uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, one of my, uh, so I got a couple of team members who are finally going on vacations. I think you mentioned you just got back from one. One's going yep. to the Maldives. I've never been there. Another's going to the British Virgin Islands. I've never been there. And I'm like kind of going, all right, maybe it's just a recency thing, Dan, but I'm like yep. a nice beach, uh, maybe a little bit of sailing uh, sounds pretty good to me. I'd love to experience some of that in one of those places. How many cups of coffee a day? Two. I usually have one when I first kind of get up and get rolling and then maybe a mid-morning uh, top up and then I'm kind of good to go for the rest of the day. Love it. Favorite manager you've ever had and why? Um, I, I would say, um, you know, I, I don't know if Patrick Salyer, uh, the uh, former CEO of Gigia yeah, is out there listening, but he's now a partner um, at Mayfield uh, Investment Fund. But I got to say, you know, um, as a marketeer, having that, I sat next to Patrick for four years, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, basically shoulder to shoulder, you know, CEO, uh, CMO, the brainstorming, kind of the broader business perspective, you know, I learned an awful lot uh, from that relationship and being able to elevate the conversation above just the function of marketing into that broader conversation was, was really special. Amazing. Last question. What would you tell your younger self? <laughs> one foot in front of the other, uh, keep on going, right? Like, seriously, it's, uh, I, I, I feel like as many, I, I think people who kind of move into these kind of um, chief or executive level positions, um, just so fortunate uh, for the journey um, and kind of, um, you know, just, you know, thankful for where I've ended up, the good fortune and, uh, you know, the hard work that kind of lead you into a place. And I just feel very blessed. Amazing. Jason, thank you, my friend. We are up on time. I just want to say a massive thank you for joining us. Dan, always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to catching up again soon. Thank you, everyone.